I hope you have your Bibles and hope you're ready to study the Word of God with me tonight. Because that's what we're going to do. Some things you'll be familiar with, some things you will not. You know, sometimes when men come and many preachers, many are looking for something new. God has not changed, ladies and gentlemen. What he has given is sufficient. Especially if we apply the great truths of his word to our lives. And so it is not something new we need. We need to practice living out what we already know. And ask God for the power of his spirit that we might develop and have the image of God restored in us before probation closes upon us and this world. And so tonight, as we get into the word of God tonight, our subject again, tonight we're going to be dealing with the behold the bridegroom cometh and we're going to talk about the things leading up to that. But now, I can do nothing. I am dependent on the Holy Spirit. And so I want to claim the promise found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, Neither has entered the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Wait a minute. How much does the Holy Spirit search everybody? The Bible says all things, including what? The deep things of God. That word deep things is the Greek word bathos. And it means to go beneath the surface. You see, we are told in the last days that surface dwellers anchored nowhere when storm and tempest has come will be swept away. And so it's important that you be anchored in the word of God. Some of us are anchored in the church. Some of us are anchored in position. But few of us are anchored in the word of God. We all need to be anchored in the scriptures that we might be able to stand in the coming conflict. And so it's important that we ask God for the Holy Spirit and that he will guide us into all truth and even take us into the deep things of God. With that thought in mind, let us have a word of prayer together. Father in heaven, we thank you for this, your holy Sabbath that we have that is commenced. We ask thee that you will please grant us thy Holy Spirit. For you said, if ye then being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And so Lord, we ask and we address our prayer to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Asking for the presence of your Holy Spirit that he will abide with us and be in us, and that he will guide us into all truth and show us things to come. We thank thee, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayer. And we ask now that your will be done, and that Jesus be uplifted and your word be uplifted. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I'd like for you to turn with me in your Bible for just a moment, but before we do, I want to show you something that just happened about a week ago. You know, we've been watching storms and tempests, and we've been watching some things. But I want to show you a clip. And I wanted, uh, some of you saw this clip on the CNN News. But I want to just bring, I just want to remind you of something to let you know as we get into our subject, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Now, I want to show you this clip that took place, and you know where it took place, in Paris. And I want to just remind you of some things, okay? These are world leaders across Europe coming together and banning arm in arm as they join together in their fight against terrorism. Some of us may not 
understand the significance of this. We may think it's just a passing moment in history. But when God allows a nation to be brought on the scene, he is trying to get your attention to go back and study the history of France, to understand what was her philosophy and what this nation did in times past because the teachings of the French Revolution, these principles of those teachings are now permeating the world. And we are watching now the one world government declare, declare their so-called unity against terrorism. And so I'm bringing this before you because I just want you to see. The Bible says these will have something in, in common. Turn me to Revelation chapter 17 for a moment. Revelation chapter 17. And when you get there, just say amen. In Revelation chapter 17, the Bible says here, and I want you to see this with me, and I want to just take to you to, want to take you to Revelation 17, verse 12 and 13. The Bible says, And the ten horns that thou sawest are ten kings. Ten is a universal number. It's talking about the whole world and the whole political system of the world in the last days. It goes on and says here, it says here, Which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. One hour with who, everybody? The beast. Now, if you are a good Bible student, then the first thing that comes to your mind is the third angel's message. What does the third angel's message say? In Revelation 14, 9, And the third angel followed them, saying, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured without mixture into the cup of his indignation. The Bible is showing that the nations in the last days who are banding together on a, on, a, on a platform against terrorism, the Bible foretells this unity will ultimately lead to them giving their power and their strength to the beast, to the papacy. Let me go a little bit closer with you, though. Look at verse 13. These have what, everybody? These have one mind. What is the theme of the one world government? That all will have, what everybody? One mind. This word one mind in the actual Greek transliteration means they will all agree. They will all come together in unity on same policies, practices, political and social and economic procedures. You and I are now living in a time when the final global financial system is being put in place. It is only a matter of time, only the hand of God, only the hand of God is holding some things in check until his message gets to all the globe and until his people fully understand their need to reflect his image and receive the early and latter rain. I'm telling you that we are living on borrowed time. God has been merciful to spare our lives for this year. And he's digging about us because time is short and the mystery of God must be finished. Listen carefully. These have one mind and shall give their power unto the beast. And the Bible says, these shall make war with the lamb. But who is the lamb talking about? Turn me to John 129 with me. John 129 for a moment. Who is the lamb talking about? The Bible says in John 129, the next day John seeth Jesus coming and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. But are they really making war with Jesus only? In fact, is there a war against Jesus and, and his followers? Hmm? Is there a war like that going on? Are you sure? Now, because remember, the first war took place in heaven. In Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9, remember what the Bible says? And there was war in heaven, 
and Michael and his angels fought against a dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. That was the war in heaven. But then in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, we see a, the devil and his angels, the whole power of satanic evil going to gather the nations together, going to gather the political leaders together, going to gather the religious world together to make war on God's people. Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon. Who's the dragon? That old serpent called the devil and Satan. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, not only are you watching the world band together, you are watching the world come together for the final battle, the battle of Armageddon, when the nations of the earth will be marshaled against the people of God. We are on borrowed time, and all these are signs that show, behold, the bridegroom cometh. The bridegroom is Jesus himself. He's coming. But are we sure about this? And why is this important to us to understand? Because the unity of this world and among the political leaders is a counterfeit to the unity that will be found among God's people in the last days. You see, we are standing in Bible prophecy in Revelation chapter 10. I want you to turn with me there for a moment. I want to show you something very important. In Revelation chapter 10. Remember our subject is behold the bridegroom cometh. Look what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 10. I want to show you where we're standing. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin the sound, the mystery of God shall be finished as he has declared unto his servants the prophets. Wait a minute. What did the Bible say? In the days of the voice of what angel, everybody? The seventh angel. The seventh angel is the angel of the seventh trumpet and of the third wall. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been in the seventh trumpet since 1844. We are entering the third wall period as we talk. And we are watching the Middle East situation taking place around us. And we are walking around indolent as though we don't understand what these things mean. God has given us a message. God has given us prophecy. And God has given us a sure word of prophecy that we do not speculate nor do we guess when we understand that history is being repeated. And we are watching worldwide events that's leading to the coming of Jesus Christ and the close of probation and an end to sin, death, war, and suffering. Suffering. We are in this time and we need to get ready. Look what the Bible says here. In the base of the voice of the seventh angel, we should begin to sound. What's going to be finished, everybody? The mystery of God. What is the mystery of God? You see, the mystery of God has to do with gathering. The one world government has to do with something with gathering. What do you mean that there's something about gathering? Look what the Bible says here in Revelation chapter 16. You saw the nations of France come together. But what spirit led them? You remember when we, last week, you might have saw in the news that they were, they were gathering against these terrorists who claimed that they were uh, against a newspaper who wrote about Charlie Hedo. Hedo, something like that. Charlie Hedo. But now, I want to ask you a question. First of all, they were attacking the right of free speech. Do you know that free speech boards liberty of conscience? You understand that, don't you? And, the, and you understand that when free speech was first a given, it was based on a sense of morality. Because liberty of conscience was based on morality, based on the teachings of God's word. Especially during the dark ages when the papacy had suppressed the scriptures. Now, why is this important? Because you watch this newspaper and these people unmercifully be slaughtered. And it was all on the television. And then you saw the nations coming together. And everybody thought it was a good thing. But ladies and gentlemen, what spirit is behind this unity? Is it the spirit of God? Some, even some Christians said this is a God trying to bring the world together. But what's this, what did the Bible say? Revelation chapter 16, verse 13. I want to show you a gathering period. Look what the Bible says here in Revelation chapter 16, verse 13. Are you there? 
The Bible says in Revelation chapter 16, verse 13, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out the mouth of the dragon, and out the mouth of the beast, and out the mouth of the false prophet. The dragon represents the devil. The, the, the Bible shows very clear for the devil, and you can also say spiritualism. You can also put behind that circular humanism, socialism, communism. You can put all those isms almost except for Adventism behind that one. Are you with me now? And the beast deals with the issue of the papacy. And the false prophet is apostate Protestantism that will forsake God's law. And because they are forsaking God's law, they are without chart and compass. And they are willing to make concessions to join with Rome and then join with the rest of the world in the last days. And the Bible said, there are what type of spirits? Unclean spirits, spirits of devils. Look what the Bible says here. And probably it says here, for they are spirits of devils doing what, everybody? Do what does the Bible say? Doing what? Working what? Miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and to the whole world to do what? To gather them. To do what, everybody? To gather them. But to gather them where? Look what the Bible says in verse 17. I mean, verse, uh, going back further down, verse 16. The Bible said, and he gathered them. How, what, did, what did he say? He gathered them into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. We are in a gathering time. The world is becoming one. And let me say this to you. If the world can come to become one in a false unity, soon they will also speak peace and safety. And the Bible says when they speak peace and safety, the Bible says when they begin to band together in unity, they will say peace and safety and sudden destruction shall come and they shall not escape. But let me ask you a question then. This is the world's unity. Based on policies, based on political agendas, based on sin and transgression of God's law, based on moving God out of the picture, based on removing the Bible off the picture, based on having a new world, a one world government, but getting rid of the old Judeo-Christian values. This is what we're watching. And you want to know why all of a sudden people are disliking and making Christians look like they're weird when they show up. Oh, I'm a Christian. Oh, you are what? Not just you are Seventh-day Adventist, but if you're just a Christian, period. And especially if you're a fundamental Bible-believing Christian, they're trying to make you like you're a fanatic. But this is all part of the social engineering for the New World Order. But we're watching this, but let's go a bit closer now. This is what is on this planet. This is what the devil and his angels. Remember what the Bible says in Ephesians 6, 12. For we wrestle not against what, everybody? Flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, where? In high places. And so wait a minute. The question is now, in the midst of this, what is God's purpose? Revelation 14, 6, turn with me there. I want to show you. Revelation 14, 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. This is under the first angel's message. Now notice what the Bible says under this first angel's message, which is connected to the, which is the everlasting gospel. What is the purpose of the everlasting gospel? Look what the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. Look what the Bible says with me. Are you there? The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14, whereunto what, everybody? He called you by our what? Our gospel. For what purpose did he call you? For what purpose did Jesus call you out of darkness into marvelous light? That you might just come to church and listen to music. You might come to church and seek a position. You might come to church to hear your favorite preacher. You might come to church to, to, to sit in a certain pew, place in the pew. Is that the reason why Jesus brought you into this faith? The answer is no. Because if there's no music playing, if there's no great preacher sounding, if there is no great position for you to take, there's one thing that you need to understand and understand it well. Though I may never hold a position in the church, though I may not excel like I would do it on some job or some corporate standard, I have one standard to meet, and that is forgetting those things which are behind 
and reaching forth for those things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What is that high calling? The development of his glory or his character, ladies and gentlemen. You don't believe me? Look what the Bible says. It says, whereunto he called by our gospel to the what? Obtaining of the what? Glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So wait a minute. What is your purpose? To obtain to the glory, to the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. Question, time is almost up. Do you reflect the image of God yet? No one can answer that question for you but yourself. No matter how old, no matter how young, the question will be, do you reflect the image of God? For if you don't, if you don't in your actions, if you don't in your words, if you don't in your deportment, if you don't in the way you treat others, then you will lose your soul. God is not taking hypocrites to heaven. God is not taking worldly people who love this present world more than they love him to heaven. You would never enjoy heaven. You'll be on the streets of gold seeking how you can get you an antenna or make you a, 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 an immortal television. God is not taking you if you don't want to really go there. Some of you want to go there with your words, but you don't want to go there in your actions. You don't want to go there in your thoughts. You don't want to go there in your lifestyle. You want this world and the world to come. You want your cake and your ice cream. But you're going to have to let one go for the other. You're going to have to deny yourself and ask God to help you die to self and sin that you might be prepared for his coming. It's time to behold the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. You still don't believe me? While we're sitting here talking about this, now I ask you one question. I want to ask you one question. How many souls did you win last year? How many people did you bring to Jesus last year? How many people did you give Bible studies to last year? How many people did you just write up in a Bible study last year? How many people did you witness to last year? Behold, the bridegroom cometh. The signs are all around you. How many tracts did you pass out last year? How much medical missionary work did you do last year? I'm asking you questions because I'm asking you, are you preparing for the coming of Jesus? Are you longing for the coming of Christ? Or are you dreading every day that go by? Dreading because you're not ready. Dreading because you love this present world. Dreading because you don't want to overcome sin. Dreading believing that sin will soon, uh, you can't just let this little one or this secret one go. So you're hoping that somehow, some way, that even if you die, God will have mercy and save you anyway. You are being presumptuous. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, 13, he that covereth sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confess and forsake of his sin shall have mercy. We're not going to be saved in sin, and if you believe that new theology fallacy, then you're going to go to hell with the rest of them that's teaching it. The plan of salvation calls for deliverance from sin, and that means that deliverance is possible through Christ then victory over sin is possible as well. And it's not something to be politically be political about. Well, you know, I don't want to teach that because the people get too uh, the people get too upset with me. They don't want to shake my hand. Then I'm not popular if I talk like that. I'm not worried about popularity. I'm worried about one thing. I don't want your blood. I don't want your souls on my hands. Why is that important to us? Because the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, to me Ephesians chapter 1. I want to show you one other thing, because while the world is having their counterfeit, God is bringing on his mystery. Look what the Bible says here. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses, verse 10, the Bible says, watch this, in verse 10 and 11. I want you to get this with me. Verse 9, 10, 11, so you can get it with me. Are you there? The Bible says here, having made known, having what everybody? Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself. Watch this now. Watch this now. What is the mystery of his will? That's according to his good pleasure that he purposed in himself. Contextually, verse 10 says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might, what everybody? He might gather. 
Wait a minute. This is connected to Revelation chapter 10. He might gather together what everybody in one all things in Christ, both what are in heaven, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Wait a minute. The world is gathering and Jesus is gathering. Gathering that the mystery of God will be finished. What is this mystery that is to be finished in us? You all know it. Turn me to Colossians chapter 1, verse 26. Colossians 1, 26, look what the Bible says. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 26, the Bible says here, even the mystery, what everybody? Even the mystery, which has been here from ages, from generation, it says from ages and generations, but now is made manifest or revealed to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the, glo of the glory of this mystery among Gentiles, which is what everybody? which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Time is almost up. Do you reflect the image of Jesus yet? The mystery of God is the gathering. But where is God gathering us? Where is he gathering us? You see, because if we're going to be wise virgins, we better have, we better understand some things. The gathering is taking place in a particular place. Turn me in your Bibles for a moment, and let's see this with me now, okay? Turn me in your Bibles, and I want you to look at this text with me, found over in, I want to look at, um, to ask you where God is gathering us, and I want you to see this with me. Turn me in your Bibles for a moment to... Hebrews chapter 8. Let's look at verse 1 and 2. Where God is gathering us is where Jesus is. Question. Where God, remember, where God is gathering us is where who? Jesus is. So question is, where is Jesus? Look what the Bible says here in Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the what? This is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty of heavens. In the heavens, I'm sorry. A minister of the what? Sanctuary and of the what? True tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Now wait a minute. The Bible said Jesus. Now we're talking about Jesus is gathering his people. But where is he gathering them? Where he is. Where is he first of all? The Bible says he's not just on a cloud in heaven anywhere. The Bible says he's in the sanctuary, a heavenly sanctuary, ladies and gentlemen. Now, by the way, it says the true tabernacle. The word true is translated. It means the expression is it's there. Whether you believe it or not, it's still there. Because God knew in the last days, Nell and White, speaking to the, our prophet, said that there would be an attack on the sanctuary in the last days of this church. And we have seen that attack from Glacier View on down to this very day, where many are denying the issue of an investigative judgment. They're denying the issue of sins being blotted out in the sanctuary above. Ladies and gentlemen, many people are even denying 1844. But let me tell you something. The Bible says that sanctuary is there. Whether you believe it or not, it's there. And Jesus is there. And we accept it by faith. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith cometh by what? Hearing, hearing by the what? Word of God. But let's go a little bit closer now. So the Bible says here that now where in this sanctuary is he? When Paul wrote this in AD 65, Jesus was in the holy place of that sanctuary. And Paul wrote this book of Hebrews in AD 65 because Jerusalem would be destroyed in what year? A.D. 70, five years later, and when Jerusalem was to be destroyed and the temple would be destroyed, this was foretold in the book of Daniel. Turn me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9. Come on. Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9, look what the Bible says here. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 9, the Bible says here, and look here at verse 26 with me. The Bible says here, and after three score and two weeks, shall the what? Shall the Messiah be cut off? That means crucified in the midst of the week, by the way, if you studied the whole chapter contextually. It says here, cut off, but not for himself. 
and it says, and the people of the prince shall come and shall destroy the city and the what? And the what everybody? And the sanctuary. What sanctuary are they being destroyed here? This is the earthly sanctuary. Are you with me now? And when this earthly sanctuary be destroyed and Jerusalem be plowed like a field, the Paul, Paul, God would already have Paul writing five years before to begin to point the people to Christ more clearly in the heavenly sanctuary, in the holy place. Now, how long was he to stay in the holy place? Now, remember, how long? If I ask that question, we'll go, we can go, we can go to Daniel 8, 14 with me. Come on, turn me there. Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. Look what the Bible says. Daniel 8, 14, the Bible said, and he said unto me, now back, let me go to verse 13 so you get it. Then I heard one saint speaking to another saint. It says here, said unto that certain saint. Now you see that word certain saint there? It doesn't just mean a saint. That word certain saint has the issue, it's the word palimony. And it refers to one who is the, called the wonderful number. This certain saint is one who gives numbers or calculations, but he's called the wonderful number. Do you know anybody in the Bible that's called wonderful? The Bible says in Isaiah 9, 6, his name shall be called wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Jesus is the wonderful number, and it's Jesus who gives the actual number. He's the certain saint found in the book of Daniel. Look what the Bible says about him. The Bible says here, are you there? Watch me now. Look what the Bible says here. It says, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily? The daily represented paganism, ladies and gentlemen, and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden in the foot. The sanctuary would be trodden in the foot, meaning the knowledge of the sanctuary would be destroyed and replaced by a earthly sanctuary ministry known as Catholicism and the earthly priesthood called mass and confessional. Notice very carefully, but then notice what the Bible says here. The Bible goes on and says here, it says here, to give both the sanctuary and the host. The, saint, the sanctuary was trodden foot, but the host, the host represented the people of God. The people of God will be trodden foot by this power when, that, will be, that will be amalgamation of apostate Christianity and paganism combined, which will form the, thi the thing called the man of sin. And he would rule from 538 to 1798, and during that period, he would change God's law. He would take away the knowledge of the sanctuary, and because the people would not have a knowledge of the Bible, and the host, the people of God, were persecuted and trodden underfoot. For 1260 years. But then the angel said, Oh no, it didn't stop there. The angel said, Unto 2,000, Jesus said, Unto 2,000, the wonderful number said, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Meaning at the end of the 2300 days, the knowledge of the sanctuary will come about and the knowledge of Christ moving from the holy place to the most holy place will be made known and the knowledge of the sanctuary will be exalted in the last days pointing the people to the bridegroom behold the bridegroom cometh we're going to talk more about this tomorrow but i want you to see with me for a moment look what the bible goes on and tells us here but now in the most holy place of that heavenly sanctuary jesus went there in 1844 are you with me now and when he did that, now we enter into a period of what? Gathering. The third angel's message is pointing God's people to the work of Christ in the most holy place of that heavenly sanctuary. What is, what is important is that the people of God have his character and his law. If you don't believe that, if we're going to have the mind of God or the character of God, what did Moses ask for? He said, remember our first angel's message said what? Fear God and give what? Glory to him. What did Moses ask God for? The Bible says over in Exodus chapter 33, verse 18 and 19, the Bible says here in Exodus 33, 18 and 19, Moses said, I beseech thee, show me thy what? Show me thy glory. Is that what the Bible said? Is that what your Bible says? Yes or no? I'm talking about the testimony from the scriptures. I'm not talking about my own personal meaning. Look what the Bible says here. Show me thy glory. In verse 19 he says, And I will make all my goodness a pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I be gracious, and I will show mercy upon whom I will show mercy. Now Moses said, Show me thy glory. God said, I'm going to proclaim my what? 
name. Now, if you don't believe this glory and name are the same, then think about this one. I'm going to just give you a side note. In Revelation 14, 1, the Bible said, I looked and Lord Lamb stood on Mount Zion and with him 144,000, having his father's, what everybody? Having his father's name. Name is dealing with father's what? Glory. What is glory dealing with, though? Turn me to Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 through 7. Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 through 7. Are you there? Look what the Bible says. And the Lord descended in a cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Proclaim what, everybody? The name, which is also the what? The glory, meaning the what? Character. Watch this very carefully. Look what the Bible says here in verse 7. Verse 6, it says, and he passed before, and it says, and he passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, what? Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. Stop. Before you go any further, we got Adventists going around saying we, I, it's, it's a sacred name and all this other. Some of them are following the Hebrew teachings that come on those other cable channels with these guys walking around with the shawls on and the Jewish cape and the rabbis and all the rest. I know where some of them are getting it from. And others are just getting picking up because it sounds good and it's a little bit different and it seems to be original. But let me tell you something. Ellen White said his name was Jesus. And that's under inspiration. The Bible says Jesus. Now, I, know, I understand Yeshua, I understand Jehovah Jireh, I understand all that. But it's simple, his name is Jesus. And the Bible says, there is no other name under heaven whereby you must be saved. Now, why am I talking about that for a moment? Because the Bible says here that name means more than title. Name stands for character. Look at it said, the Lord God what? Merciful. Well, put with that love. Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. Therefore, the 144,000 that will stand on Mount Zion, that stand in the presence of God, not being consumed because they have victory over sin, and they have glorious, immortal bodies, and they reflect the character or the name of Christ. Why are they standing there like that? What happened, ladies and gentlemen? What happened to these people, brothers and sisters? They followed Christ in the plan of salvation. They accepted the, the merits of Jesus that was paid on the cross of Calvary for them. They cooperated with the Holy Ghost in the development of their characters. They obtained to the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That we read over in 2 Thessalonians 2.14. Uh, and look what else the Bible says. What does his glory have with it? What is the character? What's connected to character? Look what the Bible says in verse 7. It says here in verse 7, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sins, and by what no means created guilty, visiting iniquity of the fathers unto the what? Third and fourth, the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth, what? Generation. Now stop. First of all, we found the name that with the character, but there was something else. My question to you again, do you have the character? Do you display it before your husband? Do you display it before your wife? Do you display it before your children? I'm asking you, preacher, teacher, church member, do you reflect the character on your job? Or do you separate the character from your workplace? You separate your God from your job. Is the, does the law of God permeate all your business practices? Or do you believe that you can believe on Jesus but still lie and cheat the people you're dealing with? Do you believe you can believe in Jesus and still deal falsely with your brother? I'm talking about this because you can't be gathered in the most holy place if you continue. I'm going to tell you why in a minute. What it says here, the Bible says, this iniquity of the fathers to the third and fourth what? Generation. Wait a minute, what's that dealing with? Is that the law? We got the character, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant, goodness, and truth. But question, do we have the law here? How do we know we have the law? Look what the Bible says over in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. The Bible says there in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children, unto the third and fourth generation to hate me, and showing mercy unto the thousand that love me, and keep my commandments. So wait a minute. We find that the character of God, the glory of God, deals with his character and his law. And where did God say he would write the law in the last days? Hebrews 8.10. Where is he going to put it? And this is the covenant. Thou make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I'll put my laws in their minds and write them in their hearts. And I will be them a God and they shall be to me a people. God said he will write his law and put it where? In our hearts, in our minds. 
If the law of God is in your mind, you can't cheat your neighbor. If the law of love, which is the foundation of his government and throne, is in your heart, you will not be a legalist. You will not be looking at every, every, every mistake that a church member makes. If the law of love, the foundation of his government and throne, the self-denying, self-sacrificing love is in your heart, you will work to do what you can to help your neighbor. And you will even help those in the church. And those that mistreat you, you will go home and you will pray for those that despitefully misuse you and abuse you in the church. If the law of God is in your heart, you won't cheat on your husband. If the law of God is in your heart, the law of love, the law of self-sacrificing love is in the heart, you won't cheat on your wife. I'm asking you, the Bible said, fear God. The problem today in many of our churches today, many have lost the fear of God. Pastors are losing the fear of God. Church members are losing the fear of God. Conference officials, many, many of us are losing the fear of God. And it's sad because it's demonstrated on how we deal with our people. God help us. God help us. How we deal with our children. Do we set the right example? Do we bear the fruits of the Spirit? Remember, the fruits of the Spirit is the glory. Do you have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, faith, meekness, and temperance? Temperance is dealing with appetite. This is all there, ladies and gentlemen. We're not making anything up. This is the purpose of redemption. What's the purpose of redemption? The restoration. What's the purpose of true education? To restore the image of God in man, mentally, physically, and spiritually. And therefore, if you say your phys the physical laws have nothing to do with your spirituality, you are deceived. You are truly, intellectually deceived. Because the moment you lose your mind, your spirituality is gone. You don't believe it? Spirit, your mind is connected to your mental ability, and your mental ability is what help you get, help you maintain your spirituality. And when you do lose your mind, it's one thing you better read. There's a book called Councils of Mental Health, and Ellen White says, those who lost their mind, or who, who have a nervous breakdown, or whatever the case may be, and they can't, and they can't function anymore, and you, you know, you see them, they lost their mind. She said, God will judge them based on where he left off of them before they lost their mind. Because I wanted to make sure you understand. Now look what the Bible goes on and tells us here. And so we find that the glory of God is dealing with his law, his character and his law, which make up his what? Name. And in that law is the seal of God. And the seal deals with the what? Sabbath. Seal is dealing with character and the commandments of God, especially though the Sabbath. Are you with me now? But look what the Bible goes on and say, now why is that important? Because Christ entered the most holy place in 1844. And the question is simply this. We are in a time, I told you again, we're in a time of a gathering. Look what the Bible says in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 1. In Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 1. I wanted to show you this parable and everything that we're dealing with. Zephaniah 2, verse 1. Are you there? In Zephaniah 2, verse 1, look what the Bible says. In Zephaniah 2, verse 1, it says, Gather what, everybody? Gather yourselves together. Yea, to gather together. O nation, what? Not desired. The Bible said in the last days, your church, your, you, you, us, Adventism, will not be desired. As the nations are joining together, and as, a, and, as, and as the political leaders of the earth are coming together, as the one world religion is now being formed that some even didn't believe was going to happen, and as ecumenical alliances are being formed, and as the Pope of Rome is being exalted and coming to the forefront, the Bible says there will be a nation not desired. That nation is Adventism. Those who love God and keep his commandments and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The Bible said you will not be desired in the last days. And the Bible said because of that you need to be gathering. But where should you be gathering? Should you be gathering just in church only? Where should you be gathering by faith? You should be gathering in the most holy place of that heavenly sanctuary. How do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean, Pastor? Let's go a little bit closer and you'll see what I'm talking about here for a moment. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Because in that most holy place was what? The Ark of the what, everybody? Of the covenant. What did the Ark of the covenant have in it? It had the what? The law of God in it. Is that right? Is that right, everybody? And so therefore, now, 
by the way, the word ark means a chest. And we know, but in that chest was God's Ten Commandments. The Bible talks about this because we're heading for a time of trouble. What you're watching with the French gathering together and marching, in addition the issues that you're seeing taking place around the world, you're watching the gathering taking place. And the issue is, where are you being gathered? Are you being gathered with this present world and headed for the wide road of destruction? Or are you being gathered on the narrow way that leads to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, which was the great light that was path that Ellen White saw in vision that was shining on the Adventist pathway? What, light, what path are you being gathered on? Where is your family being gathered on? Where are your children being gathered on? Have you educated your children for the world to be gathered on a wide road of destruction? Or have you educated your children to be gathered on a narrow path that leads straight to the kingdom of God? Where are you being gathered? That's why I'm asking this question. Look what the Bible says here. We find that they're being gathered into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. But now, why is this important? In Psalms 27.5, turn me there. Psalms 27.5. Are you there? Psalms 27, 5. Look what the Bible says. In Psalms 27, 5, the Bible says here, it says, I want you to just notice something very carefully with me now. Watch this. And I'm going to start with verse 5, and I'm going to go on down to verse uh, seven, 6. The Bible says here, verse 5, it says here, For in the what, everybody? In a time of trouble, in a time of trouble, he shall what? He shall hide me in his what? Pavilion in the secret place of his what, everybody? In the secret place of his what? Tabernacle. Now, what's the word for tabernacle? Temple or sanctuary. Where is God going to hide you in the time of trouble? In the sanctuary. But wait a minute. Look what the Bible says here. Notice what else the Bible says here. In tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me upon a what? Who's the rock? Jesus is the rock. Look what the Bible says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. Look what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. Are you there? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, the Bible tells us about that rock. Right quick, so you can get the picture. Are you there now? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, looking at here, verse 4, the Bible says here, it says here, it says, and did drink of that same spiritual drink, for they drink of that, what everybody, that spiritual rock. So he's hiding you on what type of rock? A little rock? No, a spiritual rock. They said that spiritual rock, it says here, it says that followed them, and that rock was who? Christ. So the Bible said, now by the way, is Christ in the tabernacle? So in, for you to be here, you must first be set upon a what? A rock. So you must have Christ, but what must you have of Christ? You must have his righteousness. And in his righteousness, you are to develop his character and reflect his image. Therefore, you could go with his name and the spirit of God bear witness that you are in Christ and he is in you. Therefore, and, you, and he's helped you keep the commandments of God working in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. Therefore, he can verify you are sealed in Christ. It is not me that verifies your seal. No preacher here. It is the spirit of the living God that will verify if you are sealed. Remember, and the seal is a mark that only the what? Only the angels can read. Do you have that mark? Are you striving for it? I'm asking the question. Look what the Bible goes on and tells us here. The Bible says here, because in that ark is God's law, and God's law must be in our hearts, and the Spirit of God must bear witness that he has been able to write the law and empower the human agent with the power to keep the law and live a life of victory over sin and become even sinless in his mind and actions. You can't be sinless in the, the flesh fully because the flesh is sin. But you can be sinless in thought and action. Hmm. Yes? Oh yeah. If it wasn't possible, then you got to take Jesus' life and take it out and throw it out the window. 
Because the Bible said he knew no what? Though he was in a fallen human nature. With a regenerated mind. Because he was led and under the power of the Holy Spirit. Was he or was he not? And the Bible said he did not take on the nature of angels. But man. He was of the seed of who? Abraham. Is Abraham before the fall or is Abraham after the fall? After the fall, ladies and gentlemen. But Christ did not have the propensities or the bent to sin. He never yielded to it in thought or habit. Make it plain so you get a picture. Look what the Bible says here. So the Bible said God is gathering us in where? The most holy place of that what? Sanctuary. Why? Because our time is almost up. And the third angel's message is calling for God's people to develop character. If, you, if there's nothing else you get this year, if you lose your job, you better develop character. If you lose your house, you better develop character. If you lose your wife, you better have Christ's character. If you, have, if you lose your husband, you better have Christ's character. There is nothing else more important then you cooperating with God for the development of your character that the image of God might be restored and that the Spirit of God can bear witness that you are in Christ and he is in you. Because if he's really in you, the hope of glory, then your next step will be you'll be a soul winner. If Christ is in you, the hope of glory, you will not be content sitting in a church week after week doing nothing. You will not be content just listening to sermons and being convicted and going home. You will not be content sitting there watching television or watching every movie that comes on your, on, on, your, on, on your network. If you are really in Christ, you will not be content. You will only be content as you work for others because your true joy is not in material things. Your true joy is not in gadgets. Your true joy is not in Apple and Microsoft uh, 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 programming. Your true joy as a Christian is the desire to work for others and to give yourself in service to others. That is the true joy of a Christian. You say, what do you mean? Look, if you got the love of Jesus in your heart and you want to finish the mystery of God, then you're going to go and do missionary work. You're going to go out there and you're going to start knocking on doors. You're going to pass out tracts. You're going to do outreach. Did you hear what I said? You are not going to keep this message to yourself. You're going to do all you can to finish the mystery of God and help others come into a knowledge of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ by seeing Christ in you. You say, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Listen, when I was a call porter and when I still go out, let me tell you something. There are, the power of God is not in the preaching in the pulpit. If you think this is it, brother, you are sadly mistaken. This is only the icing on the cake. If you live to only preach in the pulpit, then as an elder, you got a problem because you don't have a burden for souls. You got a burden to give people your thoughts and your intellectual achievement or your knowledge, but you don't have a burden to really work for the saving of another. Even if you have no accolade and even if you're not in front of a large audience, God is calling us into soul winning. And the time is now that we must work to finish the mystery of God. The days are the voice of the seventh angel when he shall be given the sound. What are you talking about? I remember working one day and I went in a house where I met some people that were Pentecostal. And I remember standing there and while I was standing there and, 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 in the house and I canvassed the lady on a Bible reading for the home. And as I was canvassing this woman on Bible reading for the home, this lady got so excited. She said, oh, I want to get this book. But all of a sudden she started speaking in an unknown tongue. And as she was speaking in unknown tongues, I said, Lord, what should I do? And she had a friend come over. And as soon as the friend walked in the door and saw her speaking in unknown tongue, she started speaking in an unknown tongue. So both of them speaking in unknown tongues in front of me. And I said, Lord, what should I do? I started praying. And as I began to pray, the Holy Spirit said, sing a song. I said, what? The Holy Spirit said, sing a song. Sing amazing grace. And while they wasn't speaking in tongues, going up, up, and up, and up, and speaking like that, I start saying, Amazing grace, how sweet. The, all of a sudden, they started going, up, 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 amazing. And all, all of them start singing 
the song Amazing Grace and came out and speaking in an unknown tongue. And when they got finished, they, when we got through singing a song, I said, now that we got the amazing grace of God and the Spirit of God is now with us, Mrs. Jones, don't you like this book? She said, now that I like that book, I'm going to get that book. And then her friend said, well, you going to buy that book? I'm going to buy it too. And both of them bought the book, Bible Reading for the Home. What am I telling you? I'm talking about the power of God. I'm talking about the power of God. Because God's power is upon us. And I'm going to tell you one more story, and then I'm going to, then I'm going to have my, my, make my appeal to you. Because I want you to understand that the mystery of God has to be finished. But it will never be finished while you're content sitting in the church. It will only, only be finished by you working with others. Working, having the burden for souls and servants. I never forget one day I was in the field and I told my friend, and I shared this story before somewhere else, but I'm is it for you. I was with my friend. And I was with a friend of mine and we were working house to house. And one day the, my friend told me, I told my friend, the Holy Spirit impressed me, we have to go to the hospital. He looked at me and said, what do you mean we got to go to the hospital? Barry, don't you know we have to get our goal? I said, no, I got to go to the hospital and the Holy Spirit's telling me we got to go now. And he looked at me and said, now where are we going? What hospital are we going to? I said, I don't know. He said, you mean you want, you're going to the hospital and you don't know where you're going? I said, hold on a minute. And I, got, I went under a shade tree, a shady tree and I started praying. I said, Lord, what hospital do you want me to go to? Holy Spirit said, go to the hospital on the west side of town. And so I said, I got to go to the hospital on the west side of town. He said, all right. So he said, do you look at me? He said, what hospital? I said, hold on. And I walked over and prayed, prayed over the tree again, and I prayed. I said, I got to go. And the Holy Spirit said, go to Harper. I said, we got to go to Harper Hospital on the west side of town. And so he got in the car, and we started driving. Then he started, and then my friend asked me again. He was never called for He looked at me and said, who are you going to see, Barry? I said, I don't know. He stopped the car. What? You going to the hospital on the other side of town? Harper Hospital? You don't know who you're going to see? I said, hold on. <laughs> and I prayed again. And I prayed and I said, Lord, what, what, who am I going to see? And the Holy Spirit said to me, a young lady. And my friend looked at me like I lost my mind. I said, I'm going to the hospital. I'm going to see a young lady. And he said, all right. Cat looked at me very reluctantly. We got to the hospital. We got out the car. We drove. We, we walked into the door. We walked off the parking lot into the hospital information desk and I walked up there and I said to the lady I said excuse me ma'am my name is Maurice Berry and I'm a minister and I'm here to see a young lady that to me and she started laughing she said Mr. Berry she says a lot of young ladies here who do you have to see I said excuse me I walked over to the side I said told my friend we need to pray he said okay so we prayed then I prayed, and the Holy Spirit said, there's a young lady, her name is Johnson, and she's on the third floor. I walked back to the desk, and I said, I'm here to see a young lady named Johnson on the third floor. She said, Mr. Barry, there are a lot of Johnsons. I'm sorry if you don't have the first name, I can't let you up. She said, but since you're so, but why are we doing this? Why by the time we're doing this, another lady came running through the hospital corridor. She signed her name on the desk as quick as she could. And then she jumped on the elevator. And we were still sitting there trying to figure out, wow, that lady's in a hurry. And then we looked around and we were thinking to ourselves, how are we going to get up, how are we going to get up on the elevator? And the lady looked at me and she said, Mr. Barry, since you're so persistent, she said, listen, I'll let you go on the back service elevators and you get up on, you go where you need to go and hopefully you find who you're looking for. But I can't just give you a pass. But you, since, you're, since you really are determined, so she let me go on the back service elevator. My friend looked at me reluctantly again and he said to me so who are we going to see I said I don't know yet I said I know we just go on the third floor so we got out the elevator and the Holy Spirit said don't go nowhere stand right here so I told my friend I said look here Paige we have to stand right here and he looked at me like and I said so, he said why are we standing here I said because who are we going to see going to come around the corner so a big family came around the corner is that them I said no they came around another uh, doctors and some nurses came around the corner is that them no then another family came out, that them? No. And they said, well, who are we going to use? Everybody coming around the corner, that's not them. Are you sure the Lord told you to do this? I said, yeah. Suddenly, a lady came around the corner, head her head down, and she was sobbing. I said, excuse me, ma'am. I said, my name is Evangelist Maurice Berry. I'm a minister, and I'm here, to, I'm here for you. And the lady looked at me, she said, come with me quickly, come with me quickly. She took me around the corner. I got around the corner, and she took me to the hospital room. And as I walked in the hospital room, 
There in the hustle room was a little girl. She was only nine years old. And she was dying of sickle cell anemia. And I had a, in my hand, I had a children Bible story. I'm talking about the mystery of God, brothers and sisters. I'm talking about, behold, the bridegroom cometh. And while I'm in that room, that little girl is laying there and I'm sitting here reading her the children Bible story about how Jesus will come again and how one day she won't be sick anymore and how he will raise her from the grave. The little girl read the book. She said, oh, she said, I love this story. Can I keep this book? Can I keep this book? Tears rolling down her little nine-year-old cheeks. Can I keep this book? I said, yes, you can keep it. And that little girl held that book in her hand and her, the lady that was there, she said, excuse me, she says, I'm her aunt. And I, she said, every day, for 30 days, I've been praying that God would send somebody, send a preacher, a minister to the hospital to pray for my niece. He said, every day that I come, I come and I run to the room and no one's here. He said, I came this morning and nobody was here and I left and I got back on the freeway driving back home. He said, suddenly a voice spoke to me on the freeway and said, turn your car around and go back to the hospital. There's a preacher there to pray for your niece. And I took my car ground. I drove back to Harper Hospital. I jumped out the car. I ran through the corridor. I signed the information desk as quick as I can. I jumped on the elevator and went up to the third floor. And when I ran to my niece's room, nobody was there. She said, I, I thought it was just my imagination. And I walked out my niece's room. She said, but when you stopped me in the hallway and you said that God has sent you here to, for me, I realized at that point that God had now heard my prayer and that it was not my imagination. And when I saw you pray for my niece, I know now that God does hear and answer prayer no matter how long it takes. She says, she said, you know something? I want to say something, though. She said, I'm not too religious right now, but I used to be a Seventh-day Adventist. I said, Madam, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. She said, you are? And I said, yes. I said, Madam, what room number is this? She said, this is room 303. I said, what is your daughter's name? What is your, what is your niece's name? She said, my niece's name is Kelly Johnson. Coincidence, right? There is no coincidences in the work of God. There are divine appointments orchestrated and called on by God if we are making ourselves useful for service. It is no longer time to walk around with selfishness and idleness in our minds. We must work for the saving of others. And we must work that we might be led by the spirit of the living God and that we might know him for ourselves. There's power in this movement. And God wants you to experience that power. Two weeks ago, in an evangelistic meeting that was taking place in Miami, a man stood up in the audience and gave a testimony among the Haitian community and said that he was a Baptist minister. He was a Baptist, and he'd been a Baptist most of his life. And that man stood up and said that he had a dream. And in the dream, he saw some people dressed in white with long white garments on. This was just two weeks ago. And then the man, the man said, I dreamed that I saw that the people were dressed in long white garments. And he said, and, I, and, he said I, and in the dream, he noticed he didn't have one on. And he said, what's going on here? Why, why, why are everybody dressed in these white garments? And then one of them, one of them dressed in white garments said to him, don't you know that, you, that you're not to be working on the Sabbath? And then the one in the white garment continued on and said, the seventh day Sabbath. The seventh day is the day of the Lord's Sabbath. And when that, when after he heard that, he woke up. He cut on the radio. And when he cut on the radio, he heard an advertisement for an evangelistic meeting taking place in, Eph Mount, in Ephraim, Seventh-day Adventist Church in Miami. And at that, that, at that point, he decided to go to that meeting. And when he got to that meeting, he testified how God has already showed him the importance of the Seventh-day Sabbath. What am I telling you? I'm telling you about power. If you want to experience the power of God, if you want to know if you're really being led by God's spirit, don't get caught up in the music and the celebration and the jump and jumping up and down and the drumming because that's no evidence that you've got power. You're basing your evidence on feelings. 
Your power is based on the principle that you have the burden for souls in service and that you'll be led by God's Spirit to work to the saving of the lost and to work out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling and overcome sin by the power of his righteousness. And so at this time, Roberta will give us a song of meditation as we appeal to you this morning, this evening. You know, evening morning is the first day, but anyway. I want to appeal to those who may be listening and those who are here. God has given you another chance. He has given you another opportunity.